Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another ESOP Sofa, where we're going to talk about employee share ownership hot topics. And we have uh, with us again, I'm delighted to say, um, Darren uh, Smith uh, from YBS and um, his colleague, Bryony e. uh, Paget jones um, and uh, some guests to talk about these, these hot topics. Um, I'm Ian Harris. Um, I'm uh, the chairman today, although I'll be a very passive chairman compared with my um, usual chairing style, as Darren is uh, um, is a self-starter when it comes to webinars, sofas, and, uh, and panels of guests. Um, and I'm going to take up very little of your time just uh, introducing everybody um, and showing you the agenda. Uh, so uh, here is my introduction. I'm hoping it'll be a bit less than five minutes. And then for 20, 25 minutes, Darren will be chatting with the guests on the virtual sofa. Um, and uh, uh, asking them questions, we'll be hearing some interesting answers from them. Um, we have plenty of time for questions from the audience as well, and we know that questions from the audience is one of the most uh, popular bits of our uh, of our webinar program. So please uh, do chime in with uh, your questions. The guests are, are, are really keen to answer questions of all sorts, the ones that Darren has prepared for them, um, and also the ones that uh, uh, that are likely uh, uh, to come from you, the audience. We, we should have about 15 minutes or so um, for those, and then we'll be closing at about uh, 16.45. Uh, there is one handout that you can already find in the um, uh, GoToWebinar system uh, today, which is the September issue um, of Newspad. Uh, there will be an October issue coming out quite soon, uh, but the September issue is is there for you to pull down. And it will also be there on the website if you uh, if you forget to pull it down from here um, and then think, oh gosh, I'd like to see it. It's available on the website uh, for, for you to look at uh, at any time, as indeed are all of the newspads. Um, the other thing to say, by the way, about your questions is that please do fire in your questions through the GoToWebinar system, which is the only way that we can actually pick up those questions uh, during the webinar itself. If you email us in the background, which people sometimes do, um, it's lovely to see your questions, but we definitely won't get to them. Um, until after the webinar. Um, before we start, I would just like to thank our, our sponsors. First of all, the FS Club sponsors who are listed um, here. Uh, the ESOP Center and the ESOP webinars are part of a, of a, a large program of, of webinars um, host, uh, sponsored by the FS Club. And we really are incredibly grateful to this group of sponsors for allowing us to cover such a, a wide range of interesting uh, topics. We have a webinar pretty much every day uh, on all sorts of interesting topics, and uh, and it is this group of sponsors uh, who we, we must thank, because without them it would not be possible to do these. Uh, as far as the ESOP Centre is concerned, these are the members and uh, sponsors of, uh, of the ESOP Centre, and we're extremely grateful to uh, this group of sponsors for the uh, programme that we're doing with the uh, ESOP Centre at the moment. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Darren uh, from YBS, who will introduce um, the hot topics and will introduce um, uh, these wonderful guests who will be answering his questions. Uh, Darren, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, as I've got a face for radio, everyone, uh, unfortunately, you won't be seeing me on camera, or should I say fortunately, um, but you will uh, see my amazing guests. Uh, as Ian said, I'm Darren Smith. Uh, and I am Corporate Relationships Manager at YBS Share Plans. Uh, on my uh, virtual sofa today, I have my colleague, Bryony Padgett-Jones, our very own rising star, who uh, joined uh, our team, what, three months, I won't do too much of an introduction, Bryony, I'll let you talk about something, but yeah, three months <laughs> ago, uh, well, six months ago now, actually, lockdown flies, mm -hmm. uh, and she's hit the ground running. Uh, she's our Business Development Manager. We've got Katie Stevens, Associate Director at Deloitte, who uh, I'll ask lots of taxing questions to, I'm sure, and uh, uh, I've, I've, I've had her on many uh, a virtual sofa, and she's been superb. Uh, so looking forward to uh, asking you some tough questions. And Susanna Crook from EY Director as well, who uh, has been on uh, a few sofas and is always a delight and answers uh, some tough questions. So please, as Ian said, let's get our questions in uh, through the chat box. I have had a couple of emails to me as well, so I'll have a few uh, questions uh, from my emails for you all as well. But without further ado, uh, I'd like to 
to basically go over to, to Briny. Uh, and last time you were on Briny, you gave us an update um, in the Sharepland's world that we had 22 offers, uh, invites in March and April that were that were cancelled, mm-hmm. and of those, 13 rearranged, uh, and they've gone uh, in August, September time, keeping our relationship management team very busy. But what have mm-hmm. we seen in the Sharepland's world since then? Thank you, Darren. Um, I think overall since June, I'm really pleased to report that a lot of confidence has returned within our clients. BAU definitely seems to have resumed in terms of offers going ahead and very little impact occurring to those offers that we've got planned. Um, However, there have been a few different developments from when we last spoke in June. So we've continued to see some churn with some of our schemes where participants cancel out of um, previous invitations to join the current one and of course from a company perspective companies and clients of ours do accept that that may happen but try and minimize it as much as possible from a P&L perspective in terms of cancelled options so that's something that we've been monitoring and that's quite a fine line in terms of doing what's right for the employee um, in terms of notifying them that that is an option for them but also uh, minimising that P&L hit for our clients. Another theme that we've seen is with regards to headroom and managing headroom issues with lower share prices. So as more shares are needed to satisfy the options, um, that's something that we've been dealing with and our relationship management team have been dealing with over the last couple of months whereby we've seen clients cap their savings, their maximum savings at um, in some examples, as well as £50, others have been much closer to the £500 a month maximum, but definitely seeing a number of clients putting a maximum savings cap in place. And that also prevents clients having significant scale back. So one of our clients was due to launch share save this year, but in light of a significantly reduced share price, has decided not to go ahead with their launch. Um, it would have meant that they would either have had to significantly cap the amount that could have been saved into the plan or done probably what would have been a significant scale back. So, again, that was a balancing act in terms of what the best course of action should have been, but they didn't want that launch to start off on a bad foot, so to speak. Um, From a maturity perspective, a lot of maturities are underwater, and, again, that brings a whole new set of challenges in itself. Some of these underwater maturities have been underwater for the first time in many years, so it's been working with clients to position that with their participants and make sure that um, that's communicated in the right way without having too much of a negative impact on future future take-up, etc. Um, so that's something that clients have been dealing with as well. Um, but on the plus side and on the flip side, we've got some clients who really have been flying through the pandemic. We've got some clients who have confirmed that they're going to be paying back furlough monies, who have continued to offer as normal, who have potentially offered things like free share awards to reward their employees for sticking around during challenging times. So there's been some really positive stories to come out of it as well. Brilliant. And in terms of from a global point of view, is, is it any different for global companies at all? Um, not really. All in all, things are very much the same. Um, but global definitely seems to be a bit of a theme at the moment. We are seeing a lot of companies who previously have offered in the UK only start looking at exploring international options. Um, and there also seems to be a real theme of inclusivity where Companies are offering internationally regardless of how many employees are in those local jurisdictions. So we've had some companies offer where there may be one or two participants in an international jurisdiction, but that theme of inclusivity is really big at the moment. Definitely, I can back that up as well. I've had a couple of companies this week asking um, about it already, which uh, it's it's great Mm -hmm. to see. Um, But but we, we do often think as, as administrators, I'm, I'm sure as these guys are, as advisors as well, when there's one or two people in a jurisdiction, is it better just to do a bonus for them or something like that? But everyone mm-hmm. seems to be really going down the route of all inclusive. No, which is, which is brilliant. So in terms of mm-hmm. exec plans, corporate actions, do you know, it, what's mm-hmm. happening in that world? 
Yeah, definitely. Looking at exec plans, first of all, there hasn't been much change from our perspective. I think a lot of that has been around the timing of the plans that we manage. We have had a couple of awards that have ended up being postponed um, from the spring um, to now, but we haven't had any options cancelled altogether or any awards cancelled altogether. We've noticed a couple of trends um, in terms of clients potentially starting to bring back in holding periods whereby shares um, cannot be exercised even after vesting, maybe for a year or so after vesting. And we've also seen a couple of clients move to shorter vesting periods or maybe staggered vestings whereby the vesting period will be four years and 25% of the um, awards will vest year on year. So that's a, a slight theme we've seen at the moment. In terms of corporate actions, we haven't actually encountered any rights issues or restructures at the moment. We have had a client of ours that was looking to merge that has been put on hold. And we've also had a client who was looking to demerge and that's been put on hold as well. So there are a couple of things ticking away in the background. And I think we do believe that rights issues will probably be on the rise. But at the moment, we haven't seen any come through. Brilliant. No, thanks for that, Brian. Uh, just to give everyone an idea so you, you can get your questions in, uh, you know, YBS have about 40% share of the UK share save market, over 76, over 60 DSPs, and we're in 44 countries and hold 11 currencies. So please feel free to ask any questions around any of those plans. We deal with private and public as well. So, you know, really challenge Brian with any questions in that chat box, guys. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, next up, uh, I'm going to go to Susanna. Last time uh, you were on a sofa uh, for me, uh, one of the big questions that came out from the audience was, is it the end of equity-based share plans? Um, and uh, fortunately, your answer was, no, Darren, we're still in a job. That's great. Um, but what I'd love to ask you first up is, are companies using equity plans as much in the current market or preferring to use cash-based incentives? What are you seeing out there at this moment in time? Thanks, Darren. Um, I am seeing a continued use of equity, I'm very pleased to say. Um, I would not um, see this as the end of equity-based plans at all. I think for many companies, what the pandemic has done is actually triggered a review. It's, shown, it's thrown a lot of things into sharper focus. I think it's shown all of us that we can never predict what is around the next corner. Um, and that's exactly the same with, with equity plans. So I think during the first part of the lockdown, I spent quite a lot of time talking with a, a range of clients from listed companies inbound and, and, and private companies who were just taking a step back um, and, and thinking how could they get the most out of their reward and incentive structures. The answer, I think, and this is um, inevitable uh, has varied sector by sector. So I think we will all have seen that in our professional as well as our personal lives. There are clearly some sectors who've been booming through the pandemic and yes. others who've been struggling. So in terms of the outcome for equity plans, it, it, it's, it's possibly run along those lines. Um, there have been some companies who have been looking, for example, to assist cash flow through using equity where they might normally have it, uh, granted a, a cash based bonus, maybe to do something with shares. There have been companies who have, um, as, as Brian has explained, had to do something different around the offer of their annual plans. But there will be some companies who've also looked at new arrangements. And I think we've seen amongst some private companies, they've been able to look at what's happening around valuation and provide something that's perhaps more affordable to employees to join. So I think people have become uh, a little bit more open-minded about the different ways in, in which they can get the most out of using equity. And there's been a lot of noise, I think, around that engagement piece. I think, Brian, you referred to that in terms of the international plans. But actually, bringing that element of share ownership to the fore um, and helping to engage and retain a motivated workforce by making sure that everyone f feels really bought in 
um, to the success or indeed to the recovery and growth prospects of the company coming out of the pandemic. So I think it's been a really interesting time and certainly from my perspective, nowhere near the end of the line for equity plans, which is good news for all of us, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. And in terms of what Bryony was speaking about in terms of inclusivity, are you seeing that in global plans as well? Um, yes, I think that has been something that was we were probably seeing a little bit uh, pre-pandemic uh, in any case, and perhaps the pandemic's th thrown that into a bit sharper focus of making everybody um, very much more aligned and, and working towards the same ends. I think provided it's cost effective, there are always going to be some jurisdictions where there are additional hoops to jump through, whether it's securities laws, restrictions or foreign exchange controls, where actually, if you've only got a very small number of people who would participate in that jurisdiction, it's simply not cost effective. And you might look at doing a cash based plan. Um, but we are working with companies in those situations sometimes to really document that cash plan to look and feel like equity so that the employee, the participant experience is very similar, whether they're getting cash or whether they're getting shares. Brilliant. Thanks, Susanna. And, and Katie, I saw you nodding there as well. So if I come to you on the all-inclusivity, I know you deal with huge global plans. Are you, are you seeing a change in that area as well? Yeah, I, I was just not, I was nodding because, I, you know, we're, we're seeing the same thing as Susanna really. And I think... It, it's about the, the communications I feel have changed during the pandemic. So it, it's harder to um, retain that engagement when you've got the remote working and, and all of that. But I think it's also more important. So the value of what you're giving is still conveyed, um, even if the quantum is ultimately potentially reduced. And, you know, and it's, it's all of those conversations that happened at the start of lockdown when it was award season. Um, and those kind of reactive conversations, I won't call it panic, but there was there was a sense yeah. of panic around, you know, are people still going to value what we're giving them and do they understand it? And I think it's around wherever they are in the world, making sure you're contextualizing what you're giving them so that that, that value is still felt um, against that, you know, the, the performance of companies, et cetera. So I, I think I agree, it, it, it's out there. I don't think it's new that people were trying to include different countries in, in plans, but I do think there's always that point of exactly like Susanna said, that you've got to stop and think about, is it the right thing for that location? And quite often, you know, <laughs> trying to say, for instance, would make it significantly inconvenient if you had two people. Um, so it's just yeah. about weighing up the materiality in each location. Really, and you touched on remote workers there. And funnily enough, one of my emails I got from a, from a client was, when thinking about deferred incentive awards, what are the challenges companies need to address against the backdrop of increased displaced remote workers and the current economic environment? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've seen lots of examples of people in um, or displaced workers, is the term we're using, but basically people in places that are not expected. Um, so... Obviously, with that um, are unexpected obligations on the company. Um, so I think tax and legal due diligence is always really important. Um, but I think even more so now um, comes with a kind of a tracking exercise of making sure you know where people are and that those obligations are being met this year. Um, so in kind of increased tax and legal compliance is, is definitely a challenge. Um, I think communications a challenge, as I said, you know, people in different locations or you know you're launching a plan for instance there's a lot of campaigns normally around in-office posters or in-person Q&As to make sure people really understand the benefits of what they're getting um, and all of that has had to change shape so I think keeping up with that is a challenge for people um, in this new kind of remote working environment um, but I, yeah I think we, we've talked for years about the future of work and this new emerging workforce um, and what that looks like and the kind of thinking about whether you want to do targeted awards or targeted communications and I just think that that's just here now it's not really a future conversation anymore it's just where we are um, so I think that's Brilliant. something that we are seeing a lot of people targeting different demographics more um, with with their equity or even just the communications of of the current plans. Yeah, and from from a wider reward strategy perspective, what should companies be putting into action now? You know, before the end of the current performance year, as well as to ensure their longer term strategy hits the right note. What would you say on that one? 
I think, um, I think continuing to ensure that performance is actively managed so that expectations on both the employee and the company side um, is met and, that, and that, that's clear. Um, and that is challenging whilst we're in a remote world. Um, so I think making sure that payments are fairly allocated and reflect individual contribution to the business, um, which is always the goal, obviously, as you come up to year-end performance reviews. But that, when certain people are less visible than others, is going to be challenging. And I think making sure that you've kind of got a robust and objective assessment framework in place so that there is no potential bias um, is going to be really important as we come to the end of this performance year. And then I think as you kind of look forward to longer term reward strategies, the kind of greater flexibility in working patterns, which I don't think are going to go away. I think this is just the start. They might not be quite as extreme as us all sat in our own living rooms now, but that flexibility is going to exist for a long time. And I think the tradition it kind of challenges the traditional reward mechanisms that we've had in place to date. So I think making sure that you really understand what it is that the workforce values and flexing what you, how you choose to use what you've got is, is going to be really important going forward. And I don't, you know, that might be different. It might not be monetary reward. It might be, you know, ad hoc individual performance and, and actually you only use the bonus to reward individual and collective business performance. It might be that you separate those elements. Um, but I just think the okay. flexibility people need to be ready for. Brilliant. Well, uh, that's recorded, which is great. So I can send that straight on to my client. So <laughs> thank you very much, Katie. Really great answer there. Um, so no, that's, thank you very much. So uh, Susanna, we spoke about you know uh, changing to to, to um, savings limits and things like that on on share plans. Have you seen any companies changing the rules uh, during lockdown? Has anyone changed them altogether? Come up with some fab new ideas, etc. I haven't seen a great deal of whole scale change. I think where companies have been looking is around use of discretion. What flexibility have they got to to pick up some of those changes that, that Katie was referring to? You know, you've you've got people in different places, you've got people working in a really different way. In some cases you'll have people who are being required to use a really different skill set from what what their job was previously. So companies looking at how to reward those people who may not be doing what they were originally intended to be doing will be looking at, at, at flexibilities and discretions and how can you tailor, if appropriate, um, any sort of in-flight awards to make sure that people are being rewarded in the way that you would like them to be rewarded. Um, but it ha has been more about using those flexibilities rather than complete changes of plan rules uh, in my experience and I think there will be quite a lot of review going into the next award season of actually how to approach performance targets you know it's not just always going to be easily a rerun of what you had last year those may no longer be fit for purpose they may no longer be reflecting or, or driving the behaviors that you really want your incentive to drive so I think there's there's still a little bit of reflection to be done um, I think uh, we were saying earlier, it perhaps wasn't panic right at the beginning of the pandemic, but there, there was a sort of flurry of trying to, to deal with the present very much. And I think going into, you know, next year's annual cycle, it will be a bit more reflective. I mean, you know, who knows we'll, where we'll be in terms of the pandemic at that stage. But I think we all now at least are aware that there will be ongoing uncertainty and it's easier perhaps to work within that um, and, and try and be mindful of how you get the most out of your incentives. Sometimes that will be around um, how you're setting performance, how you're using discretions. Sometimes it will be about communications. Again, as, as, as Katie said, that is going to be really important and really important to get the right medium for communication when your workforce is working in a much more diverse and varied way. Uh, than, than, than you're used to. I think but, one area where there have been some, sorry, I think one, I was just going to add yeah. one final thing. So one area where there may have been some lessons learned, actually those um, industries that have been less fortunate during the pandemic um, and where we've had to uh, advise around levers. I think sometimes companies haven't had the flexibility that they've wanted to have around how they pay out people who are leaving in this kind of circumstance. So that might be an area that, that, that 
just requires a little bit more thought going forward. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Susanna. I think in the latest news brief, uh, you know, it gives an outlook of, of uh, lots of uh, well-known companies and what's happening over the, the coming months with redundancies, etc. And like you said, there's still a lot of reflection going on on what's happened and there's still a lot to come down the road, which I think will affect, you know, share plans. On, on the last one, I spoke about um, a company that uh, launched the share plan as usual during lockdown um, and they'd hired 40,000 more staff during lockdown due to it being a, a supermarket. Uh, so obviously, we've got all that change next year because will those jobs still be required? What's, what, what's that going to happen in terms of share plans? So no, lots of lots of stuff coming down the line for us there, definitely. Um, I think one of the, the things that leads on to is one, one of my questions that I, I always love is, is I feel I find it quite therapeutic and that is, you know, what what mistakes uh, have we learned from what what mistakes are out there that we, we could help companies to avoid going forward um so if i go to katie first have you got any that you you would really shine a light on um, i always think um mistakes generally arise as a result of not allowing yourself or, or you know in sentient fancy not giving themselves time to think about things holistically from the get-go so making sure, you know, all of the relevant stakeholders, treasury, finance, tax, they're all on board from day one, the cons, you know, because you get down the line and then you end, you get these unexpected barriers and, you know, treasury is suddenly going, oh, no, you're at your dilution limit. You can't do any of the issued shares, but then you haven't thought about what your strategy is going to be or, or what other approach. And I think the other thing that's really become so much more prevalent this year, obviously against the economic backdrop, but is around um cost management and, and that's you know Susanna's mentioned it Brian's mentioned it and it's kind of making sure that you have a funding strategy that's really thought out and I think um this year it, it came to like lots of people didn't really and now there's pressure from your organization it's, it's echoing down to incentive plans I think that's brought to light kind of making sure that you have um, a well thought out fund, funding strategy so I think that's probably the stakes I see when they come to vest and you're like oh hang on I can't do this. <laughs> and you didn't realise. So, yeah, I think stopping and doing your homework is probably tip Definitely. number one. Definitely. I can relate to the key stakeholders on board at the start as well. I once, I, when I was a relationship manager, um, we'd done all the comms. They were amazing. We'd blown them away. I'm thinking, these are up for awards. These are amazing. They look really good. And then <laughs> the day before it was to launch, um, they said, oh, we just need to show our branding team. And uh, the branding team said, oh, we've not been able to tell you, but the uh, the logo is changing tomorrow and the branding, uh, so we can't go out with that. And that was like because they'd not got the branding involved early on. They'd got it all signed off by the design team, but not the branding team. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, fun to learn from there. Bryony, have you, have you got anywhere you, you, you'd, uh, you'd point out to anyone? Key mistakes. I think I'd probably want to echo what Katie said in terms of stakeholders from a relationship management perspective in my previous role. That was one of the main causes for mistakes or things not quite going to plan, facing obstacles that you didn't expect to be facing. Um, and I think a lot of what Katie said there in terms of comms is a big one, making sure that everyone's on the same page with communication. Um, so, yeah, I would just echo what Katie said. I don't think I can think of any immediate examples that spring to mind, Darren, of um, something going catastrophically yeah. wrong. I think data's huge. Uh, I think we've talked about that one before, Susanna, yeah. haven't we, where, you know, getting that um, data right so we don't miss subsidiaries out um, on launch mm-hmm. and um, and things like that. So, uh, definitely. Uh, I, can see, I can see Ian's joined us as well, so... I'm hoping we've got lots and lots of questions from the audience to stump these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, have, have you got any that you want to throw out there? We've 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 got a few. Um, and I'd like to start uh, with one that's coming from Gabby. And thank you very much, Gabby, for this. Uh, it's quite a specific question, so um, I'll leave it to you to pick up who, who's best equipped to to answer it. It's on the topic of discretions. Do you foresee any Remco's exercising downward discretion on their exec award vestings? in order to ensure that pain is shared by all. Uh, in other words, uh, executives as well as investors and employees uh, sharing sharing some of the pain, of, assuming it's a company that is in a, a pain rather than pleasure direction. 
Brilliant question, Gabby. Brilliant question. Who'd like to put their hand up for that? Susanna, is that uh, you or uh, Katie? Oh, um, we could probably both chip in. I mean, I, I think the the question of downward discretion is something over the last couple of years, maybe two to three years, that um, companies will have been looking, making sure that they've got that discretion for, from a good governance point of view, that Remco can adjust things downwards as as well as upwards. It's obviously a very sensitive area. Um, I think some of this will be very difficult for remuneration committees. They've got um, a, a difficult job to balance a lot of competing interests. Um, I suspect we, again, will see a difference uh, sector to sector. I think there will be a difference in terms of how performance targets have been structured in the first place. So if a company you know, is not performing, you would expect that um, targets should not be met um, in their entirety and there will be questions if they are around how those have been set and that might be the situation where you see some some downward discretion if that's available there will be companies you know who who, who have performed well and where it's right that uh, management should have what they're entitled to under the terms of their awards but it is it is going to be very difficult and I suspect we will see a lot of headlines in the media as we go through the sort of AGM season um, the next year and when results announcements start coming out in the run-up to that, uh, I expect we can see quite a lot of press commentary about it. Brilliant. And have you got anything to add there, Katie, as well? No, I'd, I'd just echo what Susanna said. I think it will be more around um, the important part of these discussions will educate what they're going to do and how they're going to set up their kind of formula out to the next, next round so that they're more prepared. There was a lot of review of what they could do but I don't think we quite know what those discussions are going to be yet, if that makes sense. I think people reviewed what they are allowed to do. So I think it's definitely conversations that will be had. Brilliant. Okay, Ian, have you got any more? Well, there's there's a, a follow-up question that I'd like to ask, which is actually on the one of the ones that uh, you sent in by uh, uh, by email. So I'm not sure who it, who, who it came from initially, Darren, but it was a question, more generic question, but it's a similar topic around rights issues. Uh, if, if rights issues are happening in the future, how do you foresee that having a, a, an impact on, on, on the share plans? And that's something else where, you know, perhaps in a company that is experiencing some pain, or it could be in a, in a, in a company that's actually experiencing growth. So actually on either side of the, of the equation, um, how, how, how do you see rights issues at this time uh, impacting on the share plans? So yeah, if we go to Susanna first. Um. I, I think, Darren, had you asked me the question about, um, you know, what are the biggest mistakes? I think uh, rights issues is an area I was going to pick up. It is really important not to forget the share plans on a rights issue and to factor that in at a really early stage. I think for a couple of reasons, you've got to understand what the impact of the rights issue is on your particular type of share plan because it will make a difference how your awards are structured. Uh, it will make a difference exactly the terms of your, your rights issue as, as well, potentially. So that is one point where you, you've got to get the forward planning in. The second element of that is an administrative one, um, especially if you are a large organisation, if you're running all employee plans, you've got a, a lot of data going in there in terms of who's um, able to participate. For example, if you've got a SIP and it takes time to reconcile that data to get communications out to get responses back if you need to and that will depend what your um, documentation says uh, I have seen it where that hasn't happened um, and it's not been logistically feasible to get communications out and answers back from participants um, when perhaps ideally that that would have happened so um, I think really really to, to plan ahead um, and make sure that where adjustments are appropriate, those can be made, those can be properly communicated and understood. Uh, where participation in the rights issue is, um, at, uh, is is possible, that that is properly enabled and communicated as well. Brilliant. And not and, uh, from ERS, which we often see as well. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, not forgetting, you do have to, to tell HMRC about it at year end, so not mm -hmm. done and dusted and the pain's over. Definitely. And uh, as, from an administration point of view, share savings sit uh, are two different beasts, definitely, when it comes to a rights issue. Brian, have you got mm -hmm. experience of, of either of those? 
Yeah, I think from our perspective, um, from an administration point of view, communication is the big thing, as Susanna said, and reiterating that in terms of making sure the comms are right, they're understandable, they are worded in the right tone of voice to target your all employee population, and they truly understand what the impact of that is on their plan and getting those comms out in a timely manner, especially as Susanna said, if there's any uh, responses that need to be collated. Um, from our perspective, Darren, it's fairly straightforward, isn't it? Once we've got the calculations, um, I think we've probably got the easier job, um, in all honesty, um, in terms of processing the amendments to the account. But the comms is the big piece for us. Yeah, I think from a share safe point of view, it's, it's click of a button. You can change your option price mm-hmm. and your shares under option. From a SIP point of view, uh, that's where, you know, a big change we brought in early on was tail swallowing straight away so that you know there wasn't lots of things going out on on outside the plan and it, people having to send money and etc it makes it a lot simpler if it can just be a tail swallow on, on your sip so that that's uh, something that can help with mistakes uh you know set that up in your, in your plan early on uh brilliant yeah uh p- it, picking up picking up on the mention of hmrc because it, it, it wouldn't be a a conversation about employee share ownership if we didn't uh, talk about HMRC <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and, and another of the uh, uh, email-based questions was around capital gains tax and uh, this question about whether capital gains tax is likely to be equalised with income tax. Um, and the, the question really is, uh, how do you think this is likely to uh, to impact on, on share plans? Right, so Katie, as our uh, tax expert, <laughs> you want to, yeah, you want to I take that one? That one. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's lots of companies asking the question, um, predominantly in the private market space. I mean, the, the short answer is we're all guessing. You know, <laughs> we, we don't know what's what's going to happen. But I think you know that the press and the, the equalisation of CGT to income tax rates is is a worst case scenario. That coupled with complete um, overhaul of the threshold. Um, I think would be worst case, but I do think that there's likelihood that they will come closer together. Um, whether whether they'll equalise the rates and scrap the 12k threshold and wipe out all tax advantage benefits in one foul swoop for kind of SIP and SAYE, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Um, but I do think the closer they come together, I do wonder whether that's going to make share incentive plans kind of flavour of the month. Um, more, you know, where you can completely keep and retain all current tax tax advantages if you if you meet three year, five years. So maybe we'll see much higher SIP numbers going forward. Um, I think you know there's there's a lot of tax non tax reasons why people are offering share plans. Um, so yes, it's a big deal, um, but I don't think the demand for share plans is going to go away, even if. They, they do align the income tax and CGT rates. You know, the UK isn't the only country that most people are operating plans in. As we've said, global is a big thing. So CGT will still exist elsewhere, and that will still mean that you can have benefits from these things elsewhere that you know, are tax related. But I, I feel like it would just drive SIP numbers up, if anything. No, that's really interesting, actually. You're spot on there with, with the SIP. It does... Uh... It does really shine a light on, uh, my on, on that. That's my for what may happen next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Mystic Meg. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the, the other thing from, um, from an administration uh, point of view, I think if the 12K was abolished, I think you know the number of tax returns that would have to be filled in from people making 50 mm. to 100 pound on a share plan. I just, you know. I shouldn't say this because uh, it'll be recorded and you'll send it back to me, but yeah, I just can't say how they could bring that in. Uh, but no, very interesting. Great question, Ian, uh, from the audience. Any of us there, Ian? Uh, we've got a, a really generic one, again, that was on your uh, email list, Darren, which is, what do you think the future holds for share plans? Um, and we've had a little bit of it from the from the, 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 the tax point of view, but it, it is an intriguing time uh, for share plans with... Mm-hmm. What we would normally think of as the as the sort of planning cycle and the business cycle being being thrown up in the air. Some companies are thriving and, and growing. They don't know whether that's going to be long term growth or or short term growth. Um, so I, I I find the generic question about of what, what does the future hold uh, in, in intriguing. We've heard what Katie thinks might just happen with that 
particular tax side of things, but what do people think generally? And that'd be perhaps a good question to close on, because I think we've really only got time for this one one last question, Darren. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Susanna, do you want to go after? Yeah, I think um, we have got almost a perfect storm, if you like, in terms of factors influencing what the future will look like for share plans. Tax changes is is obviously one, um, which, you know, it will focus attention on that SIP um, CGT wrapper, which currently exists. If that remains and rates go up, that's going to look um, very attractive at that all employee level. Um, I think the other is obviously the, the pandemic. Um, and those of you who've had a chance to read September's Newspad will have seen the comments in there about, you know, looking at equity to replace part of salary or cash bonuses um, or as a, a sort of recruitment and, and retention tool. There will be sectors where the recruitment market becomes very competitive coming out of this. Um, so share plans as part of your recruitment package will be um, in, interesting to look at as well. But at the same time, we've also got that just change in working patterns and um, the future of work, which Katie again referred to. Um, and COVID will have accelerated a number of changes, but I think this is a trajectory that we were on anyway. And just really thinking about equity plans for a more flexible workforce. If you think of the traditional all-employee plans and the, the three or five-year timescale, that's a very long time for parts of the workforce um, now. Um, and, and that traditional employment model may be changing. At the same time, we've got IR35 coming. And again, I think it's in Newspad um, re reported that, you know, a lot more people are perhaps moving out of being contractors and moving on to the payroll. So there are all these sort of c competing factors all at the same time, which I, I, I think the future of sh share plans is probably quite vibrant. But I think there's going to be a big focus on flexibility and making sure that they remain fit for purpose. Definitely. I think just to add to that, I know we had uh, Jennifer and Graham on from Equinity speaking about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, could could a share save change slightly so that three months before maturity, if the option price was underwater, they had a reset functionality so that, you know, people uh, could still benefit from any share increase in, in those last three months. Um, obviously, there's been talk of whether we can move from a five-year um share incentive plan tax free element to three years, you know, to cater for millennials. There's been a lot of research around millennials that uh, they're not really uh, as as bought into share plans and obviously they're the future. We need them on board to, to make sure that these these plans uh, are around for, for a long time. So it'd be interesting. I I like to finish with a question. If you could change one thing on the uh, on share plans, what would it be? And we'll, we'll ask you quickly. All you can have one as well, Ian. So you can have the plan that we just mentioned there. <laughs> um, resignation resignation can be a good lever reason, or uh, three years instead of five years on a SIP. So Susanna, what what would you go for? Uh, I I like three years rather than five. Brilliant. So a SIP, Katie. Oh, I'd like two years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can tell you are a millennial. I, I miss out on being a millennial by 30 days. I'm not this interested. Uh, Brian, in. Yeah, I would say the six, five to three, but I think more flexibility in general would be good. Yeah, just more Brilliant. flexibility in general. Brilliant. I'm going to so, go for resignation. It's a good lever reason. And Ian, you can have the final say. I'm so cross with Brian because she's just said exactly what popped into my head to say. So, but, but actually, I'm not, I'm not cross with you. I'm just simply going to delight it. I think, yeah, I'm, I, if, 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 if these things were more flexible, and I'll add to it simple as well. The tax side of it is, uh, is so complicated and difficult to get your, your, your head around at times. And I, I love Katie the way that you, you know, said that you know, actually think about what you're trying to achieve with the, the with the share plan. But I think a lot of people end up, um, you know, letting the tail of, uh, as in the tax, wag the dog, which is the you know, incentives for trying to make your your, your your company grow. And I think if we made it a little simpler and a little more flexible, you'd have less of the tail wagging the dog and more of these things, uh, you know, being genuinely effective to, uh, you know, to spur a company on to, uh, yeah. you know, to activity and growth into that community field that we're looking for from these things. Um, look, 
really, thanks very much to, to all of you. Let me just uh, um, very, very quickly um, uh, whiz people through the things they know they have to hear me say. Uh, we have loads and loads of resources um, on employee share ownership and other things uh, besides on the uh, on the website. Um, so we have the bulletins, which include um, employee share ownership and many, many other topics which you can subscribe to um, absolutely uh, free of charge, either through the ESOP Center um, or through the FS Club. Um, uh, those things are available and are uh, terrific news. There's Newspad, which we've talked about already. Again, you can subscribe to that. Um, and uh, we, we're getting tremendous feedback on those uh, resources. Once again, I would like to thank our um, uh, our sponsors um, and the members of the ESOP Centre uh, for, for allowing this uh, uh, this type of event to be, be possible. I thought this one was 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 terrific. Great, great questions and um, and and uh, a super collection of of answers. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for um, uh, for, for joining us today as well. I will just do one more um, slide before I say thank you to our uh, to our panel. Um, th th this is our list of forthcoming webinars. Um, so uh, tomorrow is a focus on San Francisco um, and London on bridges of technology. Um, if you're interested in that sort of topic, um, if you want to understand magic money trees, then lunchtime on uh, uh, on Wednesday um, is for you. Um, on Thursday uh, afternoon, uh, some long lessons on whether the religions of the book teach us anything um, uh, that will help us with our with our planning. Um, and for those of you who are particularly interested in uh, ESOP matters, um, uh, 6th of October is the next one on ESOPs on institutional investors' view on the use of um, uh, share plans. Um, and uh, keep an eye on the on the website because there are uh, more of these events being added um, uh, every day. Um, whoa, I don't, didn't mean to do that. I meant to do that. And I meant to thank our... Um, uh, our guests today. Um, those of you who are uh, uh, regulars here know that uh, I try to find a different uh, musical instrument for our thank you um, uh, uh, every time because we can't have the rousing round of applause that you would normally expect if this wasn't a virtual uh, um, event. And I decided, perhaps uh, against my better judgment, um, uh, to, uh, as there were four of you on the panel today, um, to use my trusty four string, uh, particularly as I could find a an excuse, it all sounds a little bit Sesame Street, um, that each of you um, uh, has a, a, a chord that represents uh, either your name or the name of your, of your, uh, of your company. So, um, uh, so for um, uh, Katie, uh, for Deloitte, as little D, for EY, Susanna, thank you, E for EY, um, and for the uh, two YBS, People, a little D for Darren, <laughs> and a B for Brian. I, I thought you'd have sang as a song, Ian, to be honest. Uh, I thought you were worthy of a song, that one. I gave it two or three minutes through my, 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 my book to see, are there any songs that actually use D, E, D, B? But really, it's, it, although it sounds rather nice in a Sesame Street way, it's, 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 it's not really a progression that would be used in a song, so I couldn't find any. But anyway, it sounded very nice. But what we really want to do is to thank you so much uh, for your time and for such a, a fascinating event. So th thank you, everybody, and we'll see you all again very, very soon. And thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.